I tell people this all the time when they ask me for advice, like you can't out earn a bad spending habit. If you make $300,000 a year and you spend all $300,000 a year, you're not getting ahead. Welcome to Teach Me Real Estate Investing, a show where I share my personal journey and the challenges I face as an investor. I invite industry experts to share their wisdom and advice to help me overcome these adversities with the hope that it'll help you on your own personal journey. I'm your host, Sawad Ghimire, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey everyone, welcome back. Our guest today is Nick Coulter, who is a real estate investor, real estate agent, and the co-host of the W2 Amigos podcast, which I was lucky enough to be interviewed on recently. So if you'd like to hear more about my story and how I discovered financial independence and real estate investing, then definitely check that out. In today's episode, Nick shares his story and his pursuit of financial independence and the importance of fundamental skills like tracking your expenses and budgeting. He shares actionable tips to help you get started and improve your own financial picture. So let's just get into it. Awesome, Nick. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing today? Hey, uh, doing really well. Just got back in from Chicago uh, for my W-2 work trip. So I'm really happy to be back Mm -hmm. in beautiful, sunny San Diego. Uh, But I'm doing great. And I really wanted to say I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, I know we've interviewed you on the W2 Amigos podcast. So I'm really excited to be here and be able to chat with your guests as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's my honor. I'm I'm happy that you're here. And I can't wait to, you know, uh, talk about budgeting, house hacking, all that sort of stuff today. Uh, But before we get started, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself uh, and how you got into the real estate space? Uh, and where you are in your investing journey today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my journey with money started, I would say, back in elementary school and leading into high school. My parents actually got divorced when I was nine, and we went from like a dual-income household, very stable. Uh, My dad had a great job working as like an upper executive for Pizza Hut, uh, and then that all changed. He quit his job. He wanted to be a teacher, uh, went through a year of earning no income. My parents then split. Uh, so I remember growing up, it was interesting with my dad, who was in a, like a single bedroom apartment with me and my sister there. And then at my mom's house, which is a house I grew up in in Riverside and everything went from pretty bountiful to extremely tight. And I didn't realize it at the time, you know, my dad and I would do things around chores and my reward would be getting like a dollar fifty scoop of ice cream at thrifty. That would happen once a week. And I thought that was really badass. I loved ice cream. So I was like, this is amazing. This is exactly what a reward should be. But um, now looking back at it, I realized like things were, were pretty tight back then. And uh, same thing, like I remember specifically walking to my mom. I think it was about 12. And I asked her, I was like, hey, can I get money to go to the movies? And she's like, no, you can use the money that you've gotten through like birthdays and, you know, Christmases and different things like that. And I was like, oh, I don't want to use my money. My friend's parents give them money because I grew up in like a a nice area of Riverside. And she's like, well, we don't we don't have that kind of money. So you're gonna have to figure it on your own. Um, So I actually took that. and I think that's like what really started because I still remember that moment very clearly. And I started working. So I got a job at 13. I was cleaning toilets in a family owned restaurant. Uh, if you guys are from the Riverside area or know anything about it, there's a bunch of pizza places that are downtown. Um, one of them I worked at, it was called Tony's Pizza. So I worked there from 13 until I graduated high school. And I went from cleaning toilets uh, to cleaning the entire store to doing like back end food prep. And then I got moved into the front end, cashier serving. Uh, and then my last year and a half, I was a cook in the back, uh, which was awesome because that's how I learned how to cook. But I've worked my entire life basically from then on and uh, never really looked back, but my parents were really good at saving and kind of protecting themselves from the necessary expenses, but never really invested, uh, never really wanted to take risks. And so I fell, fall, fell in that exact same suit. So I got my um, job at Target when I was 18. I started working there as a seasonal team member during college, got promoted to a regular team member. Uh, then got an opportunity to do an internship, and then I graduated, and I was getting paid. Uh, like people are going to freak out about this. I was working in 2014. I was getting paid fifty-eight thousand dollars a year uh, to work three days a week, and I was an operations manager for a warehouse, basically just controlling the inflow of boxes. Uh, and and I thought I was balling. <laughs> I was single. Uh, some of those times I had a girlfriend, but I was like, dude, you couldn't tell me anything. I was making fifty-eight grand. I was working three days a week. 
and I did everything in my power to spend all 58,000 of those dollars. Yeah. Um, and I made some really tough financial decisions, um, kind of leaning into it. But that's where it started with, uh, with Money Journey for me. I bounced around the country a lot for my job. I've since promoted several times and, and have, you know, over tripled my income. Um, but really, I started understanding budgeting and, and getting a really good idea on how to improve your financial picture from my, one of my bosses that I worked for. So I moved out to Virginia in 2016, and I was promoted to a senior operations manager, so I was making really good money. And I remember sitting there, and you know, the company Target I work for, they give you a relocation bonus at that level. So it was $5,000 tax-free that I got. And I was like, hell yeah, five grand in the bank. When I landed in Virginia, when my girlfriend moved out with me, who's now my wife, which was two months later, I had $3,000 in that savings account. So I had less than I had originally gotten from Target in that time. And that continued for about a year after that uh, until one day, one of the most influential people in my life, my, my boss at that time, sat me down. And it was bonus season. And uh, he was like, hey, what are you going to do with this bonus? And I told him, I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy that. Mm -hmm. I told him all the things that I wanted to buy. And he was like, hey, here's what I'll tell you. Let that sit in your account for 60 days. And if you let that sit in your account for 60 days, I'll buy you lunch at the spot of your choosing. We'll have like a one-on-one -on -one lunch status about it. And I was like, okay, sounds good. He knew the way to my heart, free food. And mm -hmm. uh, so I do it. I let it sit for 60 days. And I went and sat down with him. And uh, he was like, how did that feel having that money in your account? And I was like, that was the greatest feeling ever. I told him, I was like, man, you know, if, if something happened to my truck, I could get it fixed. Um, at that time with like rent splits with my, with my, you know, now wife and girlfriend, I was like, I got you know, three or four months of expenses banked up. I was like, you could fire me and I could probably find another job before I hit zero. And he's like, exactly. So then he walked me through his financial view, what he was doing to save and invest his money. Basically, his strategy was he would get paid. 50% of his pay would immediately go to an untouchable savings account that would then round up into investments at a certain percentage and uh, go into the S&P 500 index holding funds that he held. And then he would get his bi-weekly check because we get paid every two weeks as execs there. And he would say, yeah, we would spend money and then everything left over. So let's say I had a thousand dollars sitting in there that we didn't spend. He had his bank set up automatically to cut that money over and put it immediately into savings. And so him and his wife and his kids couldn't really have access to it. And like this guy's making a ton. I mean, I don't want to get into specifics because I don't know, but well over, you know, quarter of a million dollars every year. And that was his strategy. And I was like, man, why do you do that? Like, that's crazy. He was like, I'm 42 and I don't need to work anymore. Like, I could get fired tomorrow. My kids would have their college paid for. We have a paid off house. Um, and I have, you know, well over two or $3 million sitting in investment accounts that are just waiting for me to start to draw on them. And I thought that was really powerful. So that kind of started my, my downward spiral, I would say, into knowledge about budgeting and trying to save as much money, uh, which eventually turned into real estate and uh, investing as well. Yeah, that's incredible. I think, you know, we don't talk about money quite openly in uh, society. And I think that it's just the fact that your manager, you know, sat you down and gave you that lesson, um, like, kind of goes to show the kind of person he is, you know, like, pretty incredible person to sit you down and give you that talk. Um, yeah, let's talk about real estate then. So you got into, you know, saving money, budgeting, uh, sounds like, you know, you're doing pretty good. Uh, and then where does real estate come in? How did you get into that? Yeah. So 2018, uh, my wife was reading set for life by Scott trench. She was like listening mm -hmm. to it on audiobook, And she was like, Hey, I think this is a really interesting book. You should check it out. And so I listened to it on audible and that really was the spark that turned on the real estate investing mindset. Uh, for me, and that really drove me into the self education. So, um, I was really interested in moving back to Southern California. My wife and I wanted to get back, start our families. Uh, we were just dating at that time, but you know, we wanted to get back and get married, start a family, do all that kind of stuff. We didn't want to do that in Southern Eastern Virginia. And so, I was having a run in with my boss's boss that, that she was basically blocking my transfer back to Southern California. And it's not really much something that Target likes to do, but it, it, I've seen it happen with direct managers and things like that. But I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to have to look externally. So I started interviewing with Amazon, Home Depot, Walmart, all the different companies, big lots that are down here. 
And uh, I was like, man, I, I can't depend now on Target to be my sole income, so I need to diversify. So I just Googled how to make more money uh, while working at W2, and real estate investing came up as the number one search. I paired that with the Scott Trench book, and he had mentioned house hacking. And I thought that was such a unique idea to be able to have a property that allows you to live for free. Uh, because when I was looking at my budgets based on rent and all the stuff that I went into that, my number one expense was housing. My second expense was my car payment and my insurance to be able to hold my vehicle. So I was like, man, if I can eliminate these, I think I could save an additional, you know, $2,000 a month. Uh, so, and I read Craig Kerlop's book, The House Hacking Strategy, and basically listened to every podcast Bigger Pockets had done at that time. Uh, that was before the Money Show had came out. So it was really just all the OG show just cramming. I, I mean, I listened to it at the gym. Uh, I listened to it in the car on the way to and from work. I listened to it while I was doing admin work at my job, just having, you know, an AirPod in, just crushing content. Um, and I really landed on the the house hack was perfect for me because it was a low down payment strategy that could eliminate expenses. And that really paired with my fanatical budging strategy that we had. And so we just wanted to execute that. So we uh, we actually lived for a year with a roommate in Virginia in an apartment. My co-host on the W2 Amigos podcast, Xavier Marin. Uh, we lived together to save money. So then our all of our individual rent payments went from, I think it was like sixteen hundred dollars a month for both of us down to six seventy five, uh, and that was including utilities basically and everything that we had. So we were saving an additional grand basically each then. And during that time, I was saving around fifty percent of my income. I paid off about thirty two thousand dollars in student debt in a year and a half. Uh, and then I also bought my wife's engagement ring in cash, which cost me 10 grand, which was like horribly expensive, if I'm being honest with you guys. Um, it was really hurt me. Um, now I'm wishing I would have gotten a lab grown diamond because she didn't care. Uh, I wish I would have known that before. Um, but then we got the opportunity once my um, direct boss's leader left the company, I was able to transfer back. And so I got a, my same job just in California uh, with Target and we bought a single family house. And that was a really interesting process because I had, you know, linked up with a, a realtor that I knew. I actually worked with his wife back in the day, and I, I hit him up and I was like, "Hey, I want to buy a house. Here are the specs, and then here's what I want." And he was like, "Well, why? I don't understand. Why do you want so many bedrooms? It's just you and your girlfriend." And I was like, "Yeah, I want to rent out the spare rooms so I can cover my mortgage." And he was like, "Good idea," but he kept kind of trying to push me into a different, you know, three-two house, maybe like a two-two condo because it's cheaper. And I was like, no, 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 this is not what I want. And then we went on a couple house tours. I had to go back to Virginia to continue some of my work out there. And my girlfriend had transferred out as well. So she was here. And this perfect property came on the market. It was $400,000 listed, four bedroom, two bath in Redlands, California. Uh, the woman that lived there died in the house, actually. So it wasn't getting a ton of action on the market. And this was in um, June, February of 2020. And so I called my wife. I was like, hey, you need to be available to go see this house today after work. I did what any mama's boy would do after that. I immediately called my mom. and was like, hey, can you go with that board to go check out this property? Um, and then I called my realtor and said, hey, I need you to be at the place at this time to check it out. Uh, they walked through it. It was really weird to lay it laid out home. So it's four bedroom, two bath, and it's like 1,297 square feet, which is really tight. Uh, but what they did really well in the home is they basically just killed the uh, dining room that most houses have that were built around that time. So there's no dining room. It's just like an entryway, a uh, small living room, a really nice size kitchen, and then four bedrooms on the other wing of the house. And so it looked good. The numbers worked out. Uh, we wanted to guarantee we got the property. So based on the realtor suggestion, we offered uh, 420000 with a $15,000 closing uh, cost support. And we were able to get the house under contract and we closed April 2nd of 2020. And that was our start into house hacking. Awesome. Um, and then, so did you end up renting up the rooms to uh, each of the rooms? So uh, talk to us a little bit about the numbers. So you said you bought the property for 425, you yep. said? Yeah, 425. so 420, 420 uh, all in, which was great because we had to bring 5% down to the closing table. So based on like my, you know, girlfriend and I, I think she put down 11 grand and I put down 16 or something like that, you know, all mm -hmm. in with closing costs and paying the first month's mortgage and uh, some of the holding fees and things like that through escrow. 
And uh, so our, our monthly payment with PMI was $2,413. And I rented out all three. I know right? people are like, oh my God, back then, you know, people are laughing. Yeah, it was good. Our interest rate was like five and a quarter. So it really yeah. wasn't even that low. Um, but we got a good deal. Uh, and, and at that time, this is what was funny is people were like, why are you overpaying for a house? COVID's going to shut everything down. These houses are going to be going for like five bucks a piece after. And I had a feeling that wouldn't be the case. So I just was like, you know what? It's a good property. The numbers work out. If I end up paying a couple hundred bucks a month, it's not the end of the world. Um, but I immediately started posting the rooms after we did some light renovations, painting, a little bit of new flooring, mm -hmm. um, upgraded all the appliances, stuff like that. Uh, we rented it out. So I posted on roomies.com, which is a huge website for those who are looking either to get a roommate or to, you know, potentially become someone's roommate. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, and then an app called Roomsters. So I just listed up all the photos. I got my first tenant in three days after we were done with the uh, light remodel, which took about a week and a half. Mm -hmm. And then I got my next two tenants in within the next week. So it went super fast. I rented out my first room at 750, my second room at 800, and my last room at 850. So if you do the math on that, I was living at $2,400 a month coming in and paying out $2,400 a month, essentially in a mortgage. So I was living for free, which was wow. awesome. Successful house hack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what would you say uh, were some of the challenges that you faced uh, maybe initially or since then? And uh, how did you overcome them? Yeah, I so I read Craig's book through and through, I think probably like four times uh, between mm -hmm. moving back to California and then buying a house so much. So I actually bought it in paperback and was like taking notes and everything mm -hmm. and like, you know, highlighting uh, how to right. post the listing, how to do your background checks. So that was all really smooth. I would say the challenge that I felt the most, I was internally freaking out. Mm -hmm. um, even though my wife and I could easily afford that mortgage, no problem. We we're making great money. And I was like, man, this is like going to be the worst decision I've ever made mentally yeah. because it was the first time I had bought in something. I was freaking out. I was like, what if no one wants to rent these rooms? And I've made a horrible mistake. And it, I just needed to give myself some time for us to have the listings up, get activity. Um, but we immediately rented it out. We've had no issues. So we've, we've actually had, and we're coming up on three years here that we've had that house. Yeah. Uh, we've had zero days of occupancy, which is insane wow. to me. We've had multiple situations where a tenant has moved out on the 25th of a month, but they've paid up until the first because they were trying to get out on the weekend before they left. And then I've been able to get a tenant into the property on the first. And so that's happened three times now. Um, rents have gone up a little bit in the area, so that really wasn't a challenge. So I'd say right now we're collecting 800 on one room, 950 on another, and 925. So we're above the mortgage while I still live there. And I'm looking to rent out that final room. Uh, but challenges, I would tell people, like, if you're buying a house act, the numbers work, trust the numbers, don't freak out. Uh, and then the second thing, this is a lesson I, I had to learn the hard way, do not collect checks for tenant payments. Even though you're in the room, you're in the house, it's super easy to just grab the check from them. Now that I moved out, I'm having to talk with my one tenant that's on check. That's like, oh, I don't want to do electronic payments. And now she's upset because she has to ch uh, send a check in. And I was like, well, what did you do with your previous landlord? And she was like, I sent a check in. I was like, so it's the same thing. I just moved out. Uh, but it's just start everyone on electronic payment up front. It's just so much easier. Yeah. That's awesome. So it sounds like you're cash flowing positively now, right? Yep. Um, so, um, what, ha oh, so that was your first deal. That was your house hack. Uh, have you purchased other properties since then? Yeah. Yeah. So the housing market went crazy as we all know in 2021. And that was when I could buy my second house after fulfilling the obligation of living in the property for a year. And we were looking actively in the Inland Empire for another either five bed, three bath or four bed, two bath that worked. Uh, but at the time people were coming in with just insane offers on these types of properties. So people were coming in uh, on a house that was worth 550. Uh, they were coming in at like 600 with a $50,000 cash above appraisal contingency. Um, and when we really ran the numbers, it didn't make sense to do that. So my wife and I, we had a discussion. We were going to lock down our spending, really just continue to budget insanely tight. Uh, and then in November of 2022, we were able to land our San Diego property because that was our ultimate goal was to move down to San Diego. Um, so we bought a, a duplex in San Diego. It was originally listed at one65 
Um, they had fallen out of escrow twice. I came in right at like the 11th hour of them trying to get out of this place and offered them 1-4, uh, which they entertained the offer, which I was surprised about. Uh, and then they countered me back at 145, and we got the property under contract and closed November 1st, which was uh, pretty sweet because that's where I'm at right now. I'm in the little studio of our uh, duplex down in San Diego. Yeah, that's awesome. And then you're house hacking this one as well. Yeah. So the upstairs is a four bedroom, two bath, um, like 1300 square foot home with a huge backyard, which is unheard of in this area. And so we Airbnb that out. And uh, numbers are looking really good so far. We're about. Um, the first month, so we, we listed November 15th. So from November 15th to January 1st, we made about $13,000 in gross revenue uh, on the property. So with that first month's mortgage was covered. In January, we made about 8,000. And then in February, we're tracking to do about seven, uh, which is under the mortgage by you know a couple thousand dollars. But this is the slowest season and we're starting up the Airbnb. So we're already uh, looking forward into other months. So like March, for example, we already have $8,000 on the books um, before we even really kick off the month, which is really exciting. And then summer is going to be super, super high. So we just need to get through that slow season to pick it up and then rent out the uh, the top unit during yeah. this busy season. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, so what do you think, what would you contribute the one, fa like if you had to choose one factor that helps you achieve the success that you have achieved thus far, uh, what would you contribute that one factor to? Yeah, I would say budgeting, um, being mm -hmm. really diligent with your money coming in and what you're allowing to go out. I tell people this all the time when they ask me for advice, like you can't out earn a bad spending habit. If you make $300,000 a year and you spend all $300,000 a year, you're not getting ahead. Um, so, you know, basically after 2018, I immediately started saving 50% of my income. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I made a list. And, and back then it was, it was a lot less formal because we weren't where we're at now, but we were writing down what do we really enjoy spending money on and what did we not. And we found food and nights at the bar and drinks wasn't really something we like, enjoyed a lot. We really enjoyed travel. Uh, we really mm -hmm. enjoyed spending time with friends and not necessarily having to spend money in those, those areas. So we really uh, did a good job cutting out all the unnecessary stuff. So we were saving about 50% of our income before we moved back to California. And then once we bought the house hack, because we had the money saved to do that and pay off all of our debt, we started paying the mortgage as if we didn't have roommates. And then we just took that $2,400 a month and put it in a separate savings account that we couldn't draw from. And then we considered that our safety fund to build and go into the next house. So before we knew it, two years in, that account had well over $60,000 in it. And we were able to take that money, uh, apply it to a down payment. We were, in, in addition to pay, spending the mortgage, still saving about 50 or 60% of our income take that money, put it down for the larger down payment that we needed for the $1.45 million house in San Diego. Um, but it's been pretty cool. I think if I'm tracking it back now, um, with all the budgeting and all the savings we've done, we now have over $2 million in real estate holdings and I've paid approximately $5,000 of those mortgages over the last three years um, out of pocket, which has been, I think, really cool. But it can't start unless you, st you know, start really diligently saving. If you're getting value from this video, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. It'll let YouTube know to put this video in front of more people so that they can also learn something from it. Thank you, and let's get back to the show. Yeah, so let's let's start diving into budgeting, right? That's the main thing we want to focus on today. Um, for folks who, you know, they're just starting off, you know, maybe, maybe you know, the it'd be like typical first job out of college and I I'm, I'm now need to figure out uh, you know, what to do with my money, right? Uh, what are for some of the first steps someone should take uh, when they're budgeting? Yeah. So personal finance is, I think, definitely personal. So it's going to be the strategy that works best from you. But what I'll share is things that I have strategically used or I've seen other people use that have made them really successful. Um, I would first off really look at a 90-day view of your spending. The previous 90 days, that's a pretty good sample size. The, you know, quarter of your year, and then document all of the things that you spent money on. And I do mine on paper because I'm an old soul and I like to write it out. I think it also makes it more painful than typing it into an Excel sheet or tracking it in Mint Mobile. Um, I write it out and I write in if it's essential, if it's a nice to have, or if it's something that we can cut out. And so we wrote all those things out and we discovered 
we were spending on average about 15 to 20 percent of our income take home on stuff that we didn't really need to spend on and it wasn't even a nice to have it was just like we were lazy and didn't cook or uh, we went out and bought drinks for everybody at the bar instead of just going out for us and you know little things like that that's where i would start and then after you identify what are the things that are essential and then what are the things that you uh, would like to spend on calculate how much you feel comfortable immediately cutting into your savings account. So most jobs will allow you to set up direct deposit. Uh, so what we did is we said that that first starting number was 30%. We both went into our paychecks and set our direct deposit amount. 30% immediately went into this account that we can't touch. And so that limited the amount of money we even had to spend on. So then it really took a critical eye after doing that to focus in on what we could spend and what we couldn't. Uh, and then as pay increases, we have never really elevated our lifestyle. Uh, we just started adding more and more money into that account that cannot be touched uh, before we got married, which was really beneficial because, you know, it, it piles up really quickly and then you get addicted to savings. You know, you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I went from 8000 to $11,000. Just that signification of another zero being in there, like that's right. super powerful right. for me. Um, so yeah. that's what I would suggest. And, I'm kind of a dork. I like to, you know, figure out things that bring me happiness and joy. So like my wife and I spent down, like, what brings us joy? What are we not willing to compromise on spending? Okay, let's write those things down and then let's stay true to that. Because like there'll be moments yeah. where she's like, I want a new dresser. I'm like, does that bring us joy? <laughs> or does that not? Right. Right. Or I'm like, hey, I want to go buy a new pair of shoes. And she's like, do you mm -hmm. need a new pair of shoes? Is it something nice to have? So that's a good discussion point for us that we had. And I, I would suggest that for everybody. Yeah. And so uh, essentially your strategy is you, you chose a certain percentage and from your paycheck, you take that out from the beginning and you just put it away. Um, what made you decide 30%, right? Someone who's listening to this, they're like uh, trying to figure that out themselves. Uh, what are some factors they should take into consideration when coming up with a number like that? Yeah. So we, we combined our income. And so that's 100% of our pie. Uh, we ran our expenses and uh, I believe the absolute bare minimum of essentials to live were 40% of our take home income. So that was just that needed to happen. Those need to be spent car payments, yeah. gas, food, uh, electricity, rent, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. then we, we bucketed that away. So that was 40%. So then we looked at the remaining section that we had, which was 60% of our money. And we were like, okay, based on the things that we want to do, can mm -hmm. we fit that into half of this remaining money? And the answer was yes. So it looked like on paper we could do that. Um, yeah. So that's where we started at 30%. And that slowly ticked up. Now on a good month with the, the house hacking, we'll be at like 80% of our take-home income is saved. Um, on bad months, it's about 40 to 45%. Uh, but mm -hmm. that's still pretty fantastic, especially because we do really good with our, with our money coming in because we've both got pretty yeah. high-paying jobs at this point. Yeah, that's that's uh that's a, I think a pretty effective strategy from what I've seen, right? A lot of people will uh, they don't do the thing where they just take the money out in the beginning and then you don't have that money to spend. I think it's it's pretty effective you do it that way rather than people trying to you know consciously tell themselves, "Hey, I can't spend more than X amount." Right? If you just take the money away, then it's it's not possible to spend more than that. So, um yeah, I think that's what I need. Um, from a, a, a mindset kind of standpoint, right? Like, I think it's pretty tough to have the discipline to cut down your spendings, to really take a hard look at, uh, you know, where your money is going and, you know, honestly evaluate whether or not it is necessary in your life or not, right? Um, are there certain strategies or certain tips you would give to folks on like how to go about that because i think you know most folks that they you know when they look at it they'll be like yeah my car payment monthly car payment of course that's a necessity right whereas you know you could justify that you know if you can't afford it maybe it shouldn't be right so uh i'd like to hear your thoughts on this yeah uh i have horrible self-discipline so <laughs> um dude like if there's snacks in the house i'm gonna i'm gonna eat them right if there's money in my account likely i'm gonna spend it so i'd say setting yourself up so it more barriers to do the thing you want to do is going to be more helpful mm -hmm. uh, and i learned that from the james clear book the atomic habits book you know you want to create a process 
that makes multiple steps of barrier in between what your initial craving is and what or what are your initial bad habit is and then executing that bad habit. And then the same thing for one you want to reinforce a good habit, you got to create as few barriers as possible so that you can immediately mm -hmm. go to it. So I started small with little things like when I was trying to get more work done, I put my phone behind me on my desk so I couldn't even see it. I wouldn't even know that it vibrated. And I realized like, oh, wow, the act of me turning around and having to grab my phone made it like 50% less likely I was going to pick it up. I need to do the same thing with my budget. So we set up an account that neither my wife or I could get access to via debit card. Um, and the only way we can use it, because it was a small local bank in California that we set it up with, like the bank that I used to use credit union back home, we would have to call the bank during business hours and verify a transfer from that account to our personal accounts. So just that being there was like impossible. I was like, I'm never going to spend this money ever. Like that's yeah. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, so that was super powerful for me is creating as many barriers to spending that money as you could. I'd say that's the first thing to do. Um, and then the second thing is people, you know, I hear this conversation a lot with a lot of folks. They've let lifestyle creep get to the point on their spending that they're not willing to downgrade back then. And the millionaire next door had a quote in it that was really something I can't remember the exact line, but a Ferrari brings you X amount of joy, but a Honda Civic is one one thousandth of a cost of a of a Ferrari, but the Ferrari is not giving you a thousand times more enjoyment than the Honda. So like that cost benefit, that opportunity there for me was, OK, let's downgrade our lifestyle. Let's move back in with roommates. Um, let's do the things that we don't really see as a giant takeaway because we still have a good roof over our heads. We still have nice cars that drive. I drive a 2017 Honda Civic. My wife drives a 2017 CRV. It's not like I'm in a 84 Corolla that's rusted out. You know, I drive a nice car that's yeah. got a backup camera. It's got Apple CarPlay. Mm -hmm. What more do I really need, you know? Um, yeah. So those are the things I would suggest to people is like, if you're driving the Lexus or you're in the apartment alone and you, you know, you're trying to think, yeah, oh, I need this two bedroom apartment because I want a guest bed for people to come and stay in. Do you really need that? How many people are coming and staying with you uh, that often where you're spending potentially an additional thousand dollars a month? Uh, on something like that, or even a car payment. I think when I researched it last, the average American was spending like $758 a month on total auto payments. And that's insurance, gas, and the car. Mm -hmm. That's a huge amount, you know? And just by me selling my old truck that I had and then taking that equity and then giving an extra five grand to the to the the dealership that I bought it from, I was able to mm -hmm. walk away without a payment. And that's saving me an additional... Seven hundred fifty-eight dollars a month, which has been really nice. Yeah, uh, the process where you go and like you know look at your budgeting, right? You mentioned uh, that you write down everything on paper, right? Um, is this a monthly evaluation that you do? Like, how often do you look at your finances, and how often do you adjust them? Uh, what would you recommend that folks do? Yeah, um, I would say monthly is too far and few between. I look at it in percentages, right? So if you look at a month and a percentage, if you go four weeks without looking at your budget, that's like 8.25, something like that percentage of your year that you just lost. Um, and you have to now look backwards at that time versus being able to really look at it in smaller chunks. So my wife and I do it every week. So every Sunday. Okay. We sit down and we we type everything out into an Excel sheet and then we write everything down. Like I write it down, she types into an Excel sheet because she's smarter than I am. Um, but <laughs> I write everything down and put it into uh, an actual book and we make categories like needed to spend, not needed to spend. And then we just kind of highlight the things that we didn't need to spend and try to understand what we could do different the next week, um, which has been really good. We call them little money dates. We do them in a safe space. Typically, we'll go walk to Balboa Park and hang out a little bit and do it. So it's like a nice little getaway. And um, that's what I'd suggest. Look at it every week. Typically, you guys have downtime at some point. And if you're avoiding it, doing that, there's probably a good reason why. So you just need to carve out 15, <laughs> 20 minutes to be able to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then do the at what point? So you, you made the decision of, hey, I'm going to save 30% of my income. I'm going to put away into you know uh, a different account. Uh, do you eval re -eval evaluate that on a regular basis as well? Is that part of your weekly uh, checkups that you go then look at that number and go uh, see if there's an opportunity to increase it? Or do you do that less frequently? Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So things have changed a little bit because now my wife and I are budgeting together because we're married. Um, so we actually have four accounts. So we have each week kept our own personal checking accounts. And every week, $250 goes into each of our accounts. And that is money that can be spent on however the hell you want. She works really hard. I work really hard. I don't want to like have to justify the thousand dollars that I just spent on a tattoo on a half arm sleeve. She doesn't want to have to justify getting her nails done or getting her hair done or getting her tattoo done, like all those different types of things, right? Um, we didn't want to justify it to each other because we we know that there's often things that we want to spend on. And if you want to purchase something big without the other spouse needing to get involved, then you can save that money if you want. You know, a thousand dollars a month is a lot in my opinion. So I save quite a bit of that because I'm a psycho. Uh, but then we have a business account. So that's where all of our mortgage payments get drawn from. And that's where all of our house hacking money gets deposited into. Um, so that continues to get funneled through um, into the business account, as we call it, because I also use that for my realtor business on the side. Uh, and then we also have our personal account that mandatory bills and expenses get paid from. And then that account has just a lump sum going into it. So we don't now move it to a, a non-touchable account because we sometimes have to transfer money between the business account and the personal savings and vice versa. Um, and so what we really do now is just track what percentage of that is there. So if we're taking home, for example, um, $13,000 a month, did our savings account from the first of the month to the first of the month go up an additional six grand? If it did, go ahead and give yourself the green check mark, pat on the back, and keep moving on. Uh, but we track that every week to see like which weeks we can increase on. And it's a little spotty because you know you only get paid every two weeks. So like one week you spend a bunch and don't make anything, and then the next mm -hmm. week you get a you know direct deposit for a bunch of money. And you're like, oh shit, okay, I made a lot of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. So for folks, um, because this is a real estate focused show, uh, for folks who want to get started in real estate investing, do you have tips or advice on how to get started? Absolutely. So number one, really know where your money's going, because if you're investing, um, it's really easy to get caught up in the mix of paying mortgages, collecting rent, doing all that kind of stuff. So have a really firm yeah. budget and a way of tracking that. That's where I would start. The second thing is I would encourage every single person to house hack. The number one average expense for Americans is living expense. If you can eliminate that or drastically reduce that, you're going to increase your savings rate more than the average American, uh, which will allow you to accumulate more wealth as you invest that delta between what you're spending and what you're making. Um, and house hacking to me is the lowest risk and point of entry to getting into started real estate investing. Your lender is gonna approve you uh, based on your ability to pay the mortgage alone. So adding roommates or adding multifamily situation should be able to just continue to help you um, save more money and then reinvest that back into new real estate. Uh, you have low down payment options, three and a half to 5% is often what I use for clients and myself. And so you're able to just have a really good turnaround and velocity of money. And if you're doing it right, certain markets, you can pick up a house every year that you end up cash flowing six or 700 bucks after you move out. And um, you'd be shocked at how few houses that takes to then become financially independent because that baseline of financial independence is based on how much you're spending. And that's what our ultimate goal is, is to be able to be financially independent. I like the FI, not really mm -hmm. the RE, because I'm not really a retired guy. I'm kind of a psycho and like to work a lot. So mm -hmm. I want to continue to work, but I want to have like FU money ultimately and be able to say to a company or to a job or a person like, hey, I don't yeah. need your money because I can sustain myself. So we're getting pretty close, mm -hmm. which is nice. Yeah, that's awesome. So what are the next steps for you? So uh, two part to this, right? I want to hear, you know, what are your near term goals, like 2023, uh, like next 12 months kind of thing. But I also want to hear about your goals, like longer term goals, like what do you want to be 10, five, five, 10 years from now? Yeah, so I'll start short term. So this year, 2023, we're going to start building our detached ADU that we have a permit okay. on. So we have a garage that we're going to convert into a two bedroom, two bath, like 900 square foot unit. And then we'll move into that house and we'll okay. rent out the studio separate and the Airbnb upstairs separate. Then we'll be cash flowing. What we forecast will be about $2,000 over the mortgage while we live there. Uh, and then we'll mm -hmm. immediately start looking for the next property. Uh, our plan is every two years to do a live and flip on a duplex in San Diego. Uh, or triplex, something run down. I mean, I mean, a total piece yeah. of crap. Uh, and we <laughs> want to buy it. Uh, for those of you listeners who don't know, if you're a married couple and you live in a home two of the last five years, you are exempt for $500,000 of capital gains tax. So you can literally take that money, 
tax free after you move out. So that's our plan is to buy something in the eight to nine hundred thousand dollar range, put a bunch of work into it, sell it at the one point five range, and then take that equity and roll it into the next house hack. Uh, we will keep the property in San Diego forever because it will have three units, and we've got the final approval for Airbnb licensing that will stay with us as long as we own the property. Uh, and, and that two two unit will be bringing in about five or six thousand dollars of cash flow a month in addition. So we'll be cash flowing. You know, anywhere from six to ten thousand dollars over the mortgage, depending on busy season, and that replaces my wife's income if she wants to go back to work or not. After kids, we have that income available to us, um, and that's our goal. So that's the short term. Long term, I want to be living in San Diego. So this is like I would say five years because I give them my goal of retirement at the age of thirty-five. Um, mm -hmm. In five years, I would like to be fully able to be financially independent. We'd like to have a, have a paid off house in San Diego that we're using as equity lines of credit to buy additional investments. Um, but ultimately what I want to do is there's a group called Reality Changers down in San Diego. It's a um, high school program that students can apply to. They have four different high schools, one for uh, college of entrepreneurship, one of business, one of science, one of arts and music. My wife actually was in part of that program because they go to lower lower socioeconomic areas in San Diego and give students the opportunity to apply to these wonderful uh, programs. And they really change those kids lives. So I want to do the same thing, but I want to teach financial literacy courses there. Um, and I want to teach the students at a young age how to improve their financial position. Um, and then in addition to that, I want to offer those same courses to free for their direct family members. Uh, so that I can really start to make like a financial impact in the world in a positive direction. Um, I don't really care to have a ton of units. It seems really stressful. Uh, I just don't. That doesn't seem to give me fulfillment. Like I actually kind of right. cringe when I have to tell people how much we have <laughs> in real estate holdings. They're like, "Oh, you have two houses," and I'm like, "Yeah." And they're like, "Oh, awesome," but I don't want to like be the the ass that's like it's two million dollars in holdings. Like you know, take <laughs> that. So. I just really want to be able to fly under the radar in that aspect and then make an impact on the back end with helping these folks really change their fi family's financial position. Because my wife grew up uh, as first generation American. Her parents uh, immigrated to the United States from Mexico, were both deported. We were able to get her mom's citizenship back. So there was just so much in that story um, that was really impactful to her. And I want to be able to provide that same level of resource and education to everyone in the area that's willing to hear it, especially in San Diego, because I think it's the best city to live in the world. So if I can do both at the same time, it's a win win for me. Yeah, that's incredible. So for folks who want to, you know, follow your journey and follow you on social media, where can they do that? Yeah. So first off, I would hit up the W2 Amigo. So that is my buddy X and I. We've uh, started a podcast that we were actually able to snag your guys' host on. Um, so we'd love for you guys to give us a follow there. We're the same on Instagram, uh, TikTok, same on YouTube. And I believe, you know, wherever you get your podcast from. So you drop us a listen. Um, and then number two would be, if you're trying to reach out to me directly, it's the five family, at Instagram and TikTok. So I'm super active on social media. Um, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions around budgeting, around career advice, around house hacking, anything like that. Yeah. And if people want to connect with me, they can find me on Instagram and YouTube at ISO got this. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, I learned a lot. I think I'm going to, you know, implement some of these changes to my own personal finance and, you know, maybe even consider looking at them weekly because right now I, I do them on a monthly cadence. So uh, thank you so much for being here. It was uh, awesome having you on. Absolutely. So that thanks again, man. I know we connected on the podcast recording a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be on the show, man. It means a lot. I know we had a good time on ours and I'm hoping we delivered <laughs> the same for your guests. Yeah, it was incredible. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. We'll talk to you soon. All right. That is the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. It would really help my mission of teaching more people about real estate investing. Thank you. And I'll see you in the next one.